friends. Thanks for stopping by my channel today. I thought I might do something a little bit different, uh, maybe a change of scenery. Usually we're in my office today. This is my bedroom, uh, but it's really not all that different because I am still going to be talking about my stuff. That's, that's what this channel has become, my stuff. Well, that's fine. It makes me think of, it makes me think of why I started this channel over a year ago. I love watching YouTube and, you know, the reasons for this are manifold, but it mainly has to do with getting little glimpses into other people's lives. I love to see how people spend their days, their, their rituals and routines and habits and practices. That's something that I really enjoy. I, I'm nosy. I get that from my grandmother. So I just, I love these little peeks into the lives of other humans. However, I have found, you know, over the past couple of years that a lot of these channels are run by younger people. Uh, and when, when I say that, I mean like university students or people in their, their early 20s. And it's not that they don't have something to say. I was 20 once. That was a very long time ago. But uh, I find that I don't always relate to whatever they're sharing. I don't connect with their content. And that doesn't mean I don't watch them because I still do. I usually take away something out of these videos and I, I think that's nice. Um, but if they're not on the younger side, then maybe they're my age, but they have got five kids or they're homesteading or they're, you know, mommy blogger type things. And that's, you know, that's, that's fine. That's, there's something for everyone, but that is not something for me. So when I started my channel, I thought, what, what do I want to see? And maybe I can do that. And I was looking for Gen X type content, child free people and their, their hobbies and habits and passions and things for dark hearted, gentle weirdos and nerdy goofballs. And that's, that's sort of my vibe. And so that's, that's what I wanted to do. And so a year later, I've not done that particularly well, but I'm still doing it. And that brings me to today where I'm filming exactly the sort of video I would have liked to see, which is a spring favorites type thing. And I think I'll be talking about all the same things that everyone else might be talking about in this vein. I'll be talking about um, some personal items and toiletries and clothing and kitchen stuff and you know universal things everybody uses or does or loves but through my own weirdo strange and unusual lens um so if that's what you're here for i hope you'll find something interesting and in the meantime let's just get into it so our bathroom doesn't have a lot in the way of storage or shelving or wall racks and so my shower toiletries always sat on the edge of the tub, which was so easy for me to bump into or knock over. And sometimes I think even worse than that is how, you know, how the tub gets really dusty. And then because when you shower or when you bathe, it, it gets wet. And so that dust becomes this glunky, gross stuff that coats the bottom of your bottles. And I hated that. And anyway, it never occurred to me I could do something about it until one day it finally did. And I found these uh, stick on the wall type shelves. You just peel the backing off and stick them on the wall and there's no installation. And if I can do that, then anybody can. And now I am so much happier and my stuff is no longer gross. I also grabbed a little tiered caddy for the sink area to help organize some more of my things. And it doesn't quite fit the way I had envisioned because God forbid I actually measure anything, but I think we've made it work. Bookkeeper's butter hand and cuticle salve from Paintbox Soapworks is packed with beautiful shea butter and a panoply of skin pampering oils and this little jar is just a lovely treat for your grubby mitts. I love the smell of the herbal floral lavender oils that scent it. It makes me feel like I'm getting a manicure and a hand treatment from a gentle hobbit in the Shire. 
despite the fact that they are pretty overpriced, I really do love these t-shirts from Made the Label. They're organic and sustainable and all of that sort of thing, but what I like is the raw, uneven neckline. My big head tends to stretch out necklines on t-shirts anyway, and it's like these guys have already done the work for me. I also love their selection of colors. I have mustard and rust and olive and all of the best colors from your 1970s Tupperware collection. I can't count how many times I've said I was done with Stitch Fix's subscription boxes, and for a while there, I really was. But this past year, they switched up their business model, and instead of just offering you a box where a stranger picks out some things for you, they've started curating a little shop of outfits for you that changes throughout the day. Nine times out of ten, it's nothing I want, but I'm afraid I have become a little bit addicted to peeking in to see if they've got the perfect floral top for me. I'm not even sure what this top looks like, but I'll know it when I see it. And as I'm a bit obsessed with florals in general, I've picked out a few not quite perfect, but I like it anyway, pieces along the way. For the past year, I've basically been wearing two nail polish colors. The first is an illuminating nail concealer from Cure. And it's a milky white and it sort of reminds me of the creepy Sears eyes from the horror movie The Beyond. The second is a mushroomy purple gray that reminds me of the gills on the underside of a fungi with the epic name of Amethyst Deceiver. I actually wish that were the name of the polish but it's not. It's smoking hot. The last one I just picked up recently and I picked it up solely because of the name which is mooning, and how awesome is that? And it's just a very pale, pretty powder blue. The two fragrances I've been wearing most frequently this spring are both from indie perfumers. The first is Antoinette from Seance Perfumes, which is a very pretty, zingy, candied white floral. The second is the Queen of May, which is a collaboration between Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab and Spiritus Arcanum, and it's just a beautiful, riotous jumble of wildflowers, every bloom and blossom imaginable, with hints of this really charming, dusty vanilla underneath. It's perfect. Late last year, I chopped off the majority of my hair. And this has allowed me to indulge my childhood fantasy of wearing massive Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome Tina Turner style earrings. So I thought I'd just give you a quick tour of the earrings I've been wearing recently. Those were some cheap silver hoops I got from Etsy. These are some red and gold leather sacred hearts on dangly chains that I got from Rosita Bonita. Next to them in that same dish from a shop called Vanessa Mooney are some more danglers. These are little rose, um, not rose, just gold, gold dagger rosaries. Yes, that's what I was going to say. They're kind of pokey, so you want to be careful about those. On the chalice, I also have some more daggers, which are not as pokey and much more comfortable to wear and just super beautiful and unique. These are rose gold asymmetric daggers from a shop I love called Arcana Obscura. Right next to them are some silver runes from another shop I love called Under the Pyramids, but I'm afraid I didn't get the face of these earrings very well. And then on the end there, I've got two pair of earrings from Blood Milk, one of my other favorite jewelers. It looks like I must have misplaced the mate to that sword. Then I have some rattlesnake fangs, and these are just all of the earrings in rotation right now. In the parlor, we have a three wick candle from Bath and Body Works, White Barn. It's iced coconut milk. I heard about it from a friend on Instagram who 
said that it's better than it has any right to be. And it does smell like a really pineapple-y, coconutty, chili pina colada. And then over on the sofa, I have my favorite pillow in existence, which is a mythological creature's velvet pillow from a shop called Baba Rock Studios. I believe they're in Prague and they sell all sorts of decor and tarot card accessories and just beautiful stuff. I've spoken before about how I keep a notebook next to my stack of reading and so that way when I come across a turn of phrase or a sentiment or an impression that particularly captures my imagination, I can jot it down and keep track of it and use it for further inspiration in my own writing. It's a sort of grimoire of poetics and I'm running out of room in this one. So I saw another friend on Instagram post about this beautiful blank book and I knew it would make a great backup. Okay, so we're just basically making our way around the room at this point. This is some beautiful sock yarn that I got from a shop called Astral Bath. And the pattern is called uh, the Wild Oak Socks and it just made together for a perfect project. A friend of mine over on Facebook remarked how cluttered they thought the spaces of people who owned lots of plants looked. And you know, I don't think she's wrong. Uh, but I like having plants around. I like something living and green amongst all of the inorganic dead stuff that I collect. Anyway, this plant was getting a little unruly. I believe it's a monstera something or other, and it was trailing all over the floor. So I got some of these clips to keep it up on the wall and maybe train it to go up the bookcase and just keep everything tidy. It maybe still looks a little cluttered, but I'm okay with that. Over in the office, we have some more yarn. There's yarn hidden all over this house. Uh, but this is some sock yarn, a very beautiful soft yarn from Dragon Horde Yarns. And it's just the most gorgeous acid green or acid yellow color that's so much fun to work with. And again, there's that wild oak pattern. I saw a YouTuber drinking out of this mug and I had to have it. I am very easily influenced in case you didn't know. It's Ray Dunn. Please don't judge me. This is a project bag that I bought from my friend Erica's shop where she sells um, notions and accessories for knitting and sewing. And I just love this vintage floral fabric and that's more Dragon Horde yarn in there. It's um, not a sock this time. This is going to be a scarf. But at any rate, it's just the perfect size for a ball of yarn or two and your project, even if your project is a, you know, a thousand mile long scarf, it just carries it all beautifully and it is a phenomenally gorgeous bag. This may well be the most frivolous purchase I have ever made and I don't care. It is a phone case commemorating the cover of my book with that outrageously incredible Hilma of Clint painting and it is made by Shimmer Sorceress and Wizard of Big Glitter Energy Sparkle Dome Studio. It is an incredible little treasure and I love it so much. Conversely, this is maybe the least glamorous thing on my list. I had a surplus of cords and I didn't have any um, extra places to plug anything in. So I finally found, I don't know, someone must have posted this somewhere. I, like I said, I'm easily influenced. Um, this little plugger inner thing, what are these called? Oh, this power strip seems to fit my purposes, although I should probably find some way to organize it or tidy it. And speaking of which, if anyone's got any ideas on how to organize or tidy my candles, I'm all ears. The last thing in my office area is something I recently acquired. This is a gift that my best good friend got me for my birthday. And how perfect is that? Yes, we are silently judging you and your terrible perfume choices.
It's true, always. I thought amongst these favorites, I might include a few of the recipes that I've been returning to again and again over the past few months. For as long as I've had a kitchen, I have been attempting to make bread, but mostly what I've been churning out are just sad loaves of failure. I finally found a recipe that I can't seem to screw up, and that is the plush, pillowy Japanese milk bread. This recipe comes from Chef John over at Food Wishes, and it's probably adapted from some other recipe, but it it's kind of interesting in that it starts out with a roux of sorts. It's a paste of milk and flour and water that you cook up until it's thick. And then you add it to your other ingredients, the flour and uh, the yeast and some sugar and egg and butter. So it's got a lot of really kind of luxurious ingredients in it. And it just makes a beautiful dough to work with. So if you're afraid of working with bread or you've not had good luck with bread in the past, it's just, I don't know, you can't go wrong with this one. I'm quite certain that whatever you do with this bread, whatever kind of sandwich you make with it, it's going to be amazing. I've been serving it with egg salad. This recipe is also from Chef John. It's a Japanese style egg salad with Kewpie mayo and a few other extra ingredients and it makes for a delicious sandwich. Which, while I'm eating it, I try not to think of that episode of Futurama where Fry got the egg salad sandwich from the gas station toilet because that grosses me out and ruins my experience. It's not easy to make egg salad look good, and I didn't, but it does taste really good. While I really love chicken tikka masala, I've never been happy with my attempts to recreate it at home. It's always missing something. It never tastes exactly like I expect it to, and it's just never as good as it is in a restaurant. I do think I found a recipe that gets really close though, and this is Joshua Weissman's tikka masala recipe. Joshua Weissman has a YouTube channel. I don't mean to be unkind, but I do find him a little bit hard to watch. However, every recipe I've tried that he shares has been Excellent. So despite the fact that I find him a little bit, I don't know, cringy, I do keep watching him. Luckily, you can find his recipes on his blog as well, so you don't even have to look at the YouTube channel if you don't want to. At any rate, this tikka masala recipe is top-notch. I've made it maybe five or six or seven times in the past six months, and here's a peek at the end result. It's pretty fabulous. One of the highlights of my workday, and definitely one of my favorite non-tangible things lately, is something that we started doing about six months ago. Every day, around three o'clock or so, Yvonne and I take a walk around the house to peek in on the growing and movings of the seedlings and sprouts and flowers, and all of the bees and bugs and lizards and other daily dramas that take place in our backyard. We don't have a very big house, it's maybe a five minute walk, but it's just a, a lovely break to the day to get some fresh air and move around, so I thought I might take you with us on a little garden tour.
Well, I had planned on ending the video at this point, but I had totally forgotten there were a few interesting things that I've been watching or reading that were really worth a mention as well. So I'm just going to sneak that in right here. I've been reading and rereading both books of enchanting advice from Russian-American poet Taisia Kataiskaya, who writes from the perspective of Russia's most infamous witch, Baba Yaga. My dear friend Sonia, also a Russian poet, has written on how this folkloric entity is both benevolent and dangerous, and ultimately more unpredictable than evil, and that's exactly how these wildly imaginative missives read, beautifully and compellingly unpredictable. These books would make delicious gifts for your most daydreamy, whimsical friends, and I will illustrate my point by sharing a brief passage of counsel from the marvelously mercurial crone herself. Gaylords of Darkness has all the trappings of something I might hate if I'm being honest. My least favorite kind of podcast or any interaction really is when two friends' conversations devolves into tangents and inside jokes, and it's awkward and it makes me feel like a third wheel. Stacy and Anthony wander all over the place and ramble about all kinds of silliness, and I'm fairly certain they think they're quite amusing, and you know what? They are. It must be that they're just on the right sort of weird wavelength as I am, or that their fanciful ridiculousness and whimsy aligns in all the right ways with mine, because I love them. And their existence in this world truly makes it a better and a million times more interesting place. Listening to them chat about horror movies, their thoughts and insights and experiences with them, reminds me of listening in on the coolest conversation at a party, and wishing and hoping against all hope that they were also talking with me. With every single episode, I come away with a fresh take on horror, and also having peed myself a little from laughing so hard. The Queen of Black Magic is an Indonesian horror film I had heard about, promptly forgot about, and then my interest was rekindled when I heard the glowing things that the aforementioned Anthony and Stacy from Gaylords of Darkness had to say about it. A loose 1981 remake of a film sees three estranged orphan friends meeting up several decades after a traumatic event to say goodbye to the head of the orphanage who is dying. Increasingly weird and violent things begin to happen once they arrive with their families in tow, and uncertain of the source, they soon discover that the secret from their past is much more terrible and tragic than they realized. It's a pretty bonkers film in terms of story and uh, gory. And like uh, director Joko Anwar's previous offering, Satan Slaves and Empedagore, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Liziki's YouTube channel is another fleeting nugget that someone had mentioned to me a year or so ago and then I tucked away to look into later and of course I never did. I saw the Chinese video blogger referenced again somewhere in my Twitter feed in the past few months and I decided to have a peek at whatever they're all about and I was utterly entranced. Known for her food and handicraft preparation and depicting idyllic interludes of her life in her hometown. Her storybook videos emphasize a stunningly beautiful countryside and so many compelling ancient traditions. There's a highly elaborate drama to the skills and craftsmanship that she shares in her incredible creations, whether it's salted egg yolks from the ducks she's raised by hands, or the furniture she creates from stalks of bamboo, or the petals she cuts from a single piece of silk and colors one by one with vivid botanical dyes to create a charming peach blossom headdress and matching combs. You combine these creations with the pastoral scenes of the seasonal landscape and the lovely lilting tranquility of the soundtrack. It conjures a wistfulness for a gem of life you've never experienced, but you certainly want to somehow get back to and I can't get enough of it. So that was it, my spring 2021 needful things and favorites. One thing I forgot to mention, but which I'm wearing today, are these beautiful uh, gold 
eye earrings from jeweler and metalsmith Holly Babasufi. And I will link to her along with everything else I've mentioned in the description box below. If you enjoyed taking this little tour with me today, I hope you'll like this video. And if you're into videos of favorites and um, collections and that sort of thing, I hope you'll visit me again. Uh, perhaps you'll consider subscribing to my channel. And until next time, stay fancy. Until later, weirdos.